Hi, this is Jennifer Gonzalez welcoming you to episode 68 of the Cult of Pedagogy podcast. In this episode, we're going to talk about 12 ways to support English learners in the mainstream classroom. So you have a new student and he speaks no English. His family has just moved to your town from Japan, and although he receives English as a second language support, he will also be sitting in your room every day. The plan is to just give him more exposure to English. How can you be a good teacher to someone who barely understands you? According to the National Center for Education Statistics, an average of 9% of students in US public schools are English language learners. That number is close to 14% in cities. Although many of these students start off in high intensity, whole day English programs, most are integrated into mainstream classrooms within a year, well before their English language skills would be considered proficient. How prepared are you to teach these students? If you're like most classroom teachers, you have little to no training in the most effective methods for working with English language learners. So that means we have a problem. Lots of ELL kids in regular classrooms and no teacher training to ensure the success of that placement. So to learn more about how to solve this problem, I interviewed three ESL teachers. Now their interviews are not actually going to be played in this episode. These are just um, people that I talked to outside and what I'm going to do is share with you 12 strategies that these teachers recommend classroom teachers do to improve instruction for English language learners. What's good about these is that they're simple, they are not very time consuming, and best of all, they are going to actually help all of your students learn better. Now before we get started, I've got two things to share with you. First, this episode is brought to you by the Teacher's Guide to Tech. I created this guide a few years ago after learning that one of your biggest struggles is keeping up with technology. You want to try new tools you know doing this would probably make learning more powerful and your teaching more effective, but you just don't have the time to figure out which tools to use. The Teacher's Guide to Tech is like an encyclopedia of over 150 tech tools organized by function. So there's a section on assessment tools, a section on flipped learning tools, one on interactive posters, over 30 different categories. On each page, I feature a different tool with a quick, simple explanation of what it does, a screenshot of the tool in action, a link to the website, and a link to a video that shows you how the tool works. On top of this, you also get a glossary of over 80 tech terms and tons of helpful advice for implementing tech in your classroom. It's digital, this is a PDF, so you keep a copy on your home computer, on your work computer, you can use it on your iPad, basically anywhere you might wanna quickly look something up. The 2017 edition of the guide is ready for download right now at teachersguidetotech.com. And because you're a podcast listener, you will get a 10% discount on a single user license by entering the code LISTENER at checkout. Also, I want to thank you for the reviews you've left for this podcast on iTunes. This really helps bring more listeners to the show, and I am so grateful to every person who takes the time to do it. If you've been enjoying the show for a while and you haven't left a review yet, I would love for you to head over to iTunes and do so. Thank you so much. Okay, let's get into these 12 ways that you can support English learners in your mainstream classroom. So the first strategy is make it visual. And this comes from my friend, Melissa Eddington, who is an Ohio-based ESL teacher. And by the way, I'll stop for a second and let's just talk about terminology. Uh, I use the term ESL uh, partly out of habit, uh, but I believe in many places the term ESL is becoming an outdated term. And here's why. Uh, ESL, the S is for second, as in English as a second language. And the reason that that is now being seen as inaccurate is because a lot of our students come to us already knowing multiple languages and English is just the, the one that they are learning now. And so it just doesn't really recognize the depth of their background to say that English is their second language. So 
the term ELL gets used to mean English language learners. And that just means whatever their history is, they are now currently learning English. Just recently, a lot of states have now moved to, and I think I was sent a document that said that this is sort of official nationwide. Um, now they have changed the term to just English learners, and the abbreviation for that is EL. And I would just like to take a moment to speak to whoever made that decision because when you go to Google EL, you get a lot of um, results that are not English learners because EL is like the word the in Spanish. So I really wish that we had stuck with ELL. However, that's, that's the deal right now with English language terminology. So I will probably be using these terms interchangeably as I talk about this stuff. And I apologize if I'm not um, current all the time, but hopefully the content and the information that I'm getting across is is what's going to actually get through. Okay, so Melissa Eddington is uh, teaches ESL in Ohio, and her her first tip is to make your instruction visual. Here's what she says: ELL kids have a harder time processing spoken language, and so she says instructions, even basic directions for classroom procedures, should be written on the board whenever possible because that just makes it easier for them to process it. Challenging concepts should be diagrammed or supported with pictures. And also physically modeling the steps of a process that you want them to do or showing students what a finished product should look like, these can go a long way toward helping students understand what you want from them. Sometimes, Melissa Eddington says, showing our students what to do is all they need in order to do it. And what's great about this is that this will also help reach all of the rest of your students as well. So number one is make it visual. Number two is build in more group work. This one came from uh, my friend Kim, who also is an ESL teacher. And this is what she says about group work. Kids are not just empty glasses that we pour stuff into, and then at the end of the day, they dump it back onto a test. She says, if you really want the kids to learn, they've got to be engaged. And so that means less teacher-led whole class instruction and more small groups where students can practice language with their peers in a more personal, lower risk setting. And if ELL students attend your class with a resource teacher, make use of that person. In most cases, the resource teacher doesn't have to work exclusively with the ELL students. They can work with smaller groups that happen to contain these students. And this will help to improve this teacher-student ratio, and it'll give kids more time to do this active practice instead of just listening. Number three is communicate with the ESL teacher. And for this one, I interviewed my mom. <laughs> she is, actually, she is now a former ESL teacher. Her name is Mary Yurkoski, and she taught ESL in Massachusetts for a number of years. And so I wanted to get her thoughts on this one as well. She credits much of her student success to the strong relationships she had with the regular classroom teachers. And this is what she said. The classroom teachers were always talking to me about what they were doing in their classes. This made it so easy for me to support them. So if a teacher was gonna be doing a unit on plants, I could make sure we use some of that same vocabulary in, in the ESL class. So ideally, this could be systematized, where the ESL teacher regularly gets copies of lesson plans or collaborates with regular classroom teachers to build a solid back and forth system. But it doesn't have to be that much work. Just talk to each other, she says. Talk about what's going on in your classrooms, invite each other to special presentations, share what your students are learning, and the words will naturally find their way into the ESL class. So the first three are make it visual, build in more group work, and communicate with the ESL teacher. The fourth one is honor the silent period. And this is one of those things that people who teach English as a new language, they know about this. Uh, a lot of the rest of us don't. Many new language learners go through a silent period during which they will speak very little, if at all. Melissa Eddington says, don't force them to talk if they don't want to. A lot of students who come from cultures outside of America want to be perfect when they speak. So they will not share until they feel they're at a point where they're perfect. 
So for the rest of us teachers, just knowing that this is a normal stage in second language acquisition should help relieve any pressure you feel to move them forward with talking too quickly. Number five is allow some scaffolding with the native language. So this has been a hotly debated topic in uh, language learning communities. Uh, some educators in this field feel as though the student should only speak English, even if their English is not very good, that they should be required to speak English as much as possible and not allowed to fall back on their first language. Uh, but the practice of allowing them to use their second language as a support is starting to gain a little bit more acceptance. What Mary Yurkowski says is some students are afraid to open their mouths at all for fear of sounding stupid or just not knowing the words to use. Letting them explain things or ask questions in their first language gets them to relax and feel like a part of the class. And this doesn't only apply to spoken language. If you give students a written assignment but the ELL student doesn't yet have the proficiency to handle writing his response in English, Melissa Eddington says, don't make them just sit there and do nothing. Let them write in their first language if they're able. This allows them to still participate in journal writing or a math extended response, even if you can't read what they write. There has even been some evidence that allowing second language learners to pre-write and brainstorm in their first language results in higher quality writing in the second language in later stages of the writing process. And I actually have a link to that study um, on the site. If you go to cultofpedagogy.com and click on podcast at the top and then go to episode 68, you will be sent to this article that's got the links in it. So, so far we've got make it visual. Number two, build in more group work. Number three, communicate with the ESL teacher. Number four, honor the silent period. Five, allow some scaffolding with the native language. And number six is look out for culturally unique vocabulary. For most of these kids, their background knowledge is lacking, especially with things that are unique to American or westernized culture. This is Melissa Eddington. She says it's important to directly teach certain vocabulary words. Show them videos of what it looks like to toss pizza dough. Show pictures of a jukebox or a clothing rack, things that are not necessarily common in their own language. One way to differentiate for ELL students is to consider the whole list of terms you're going to teach for a unit. And if you think an English language learner may be overwhelmed by such a long list, omit those words that are not essential to understanding the larger topic at hand. Number seven is use sentence frames to give students practice with academic language. All students, not just English language learners, need practice with academic conversations. If you use sentence frames, which are partially completed sentences, like I disagree with what blank said because blank, these show students how to structure language in a formal way. If you keep these posted in a highly visible spot in your classroom and require students to refer to them during discussions and while they write, this is going to really help them. For this kind of language to really sink in, Kim says it has to become a regular part of class. She says they won't do it if it's not the norm in class because they'll be embarrassed to use it among their peers. But if they can put it off on the teacher and say, oh, well, you know, Miss Kim makes me talk like this, then they don't look as hoity-toity as they would otherwise. So if you want the students to use these sentence frames, this has to become a regular part of class. The eighth strategy that you can use is to pre-teach whenever possible. If you're going to be reading a certain article next week, Give your ESL students a copy of it now. If you plan to show a YouTube video tomorrow, send a link to your ESL students today. Any chance you can give these students to preview material will increase the odds that they'll understand it on the day you present it to everyone else. Yurkowski says the kids feel so empowered if they've had a chance to look at the material ahead of time. Number nine is learn about the cultural background of your students. Our second language populations grow more diverse every year. Taking the time to learn the basics of where a child comes from exactly 
not, quote, somewhere in the Middle East or somewhere in South America or Asia or Africa, but exactly where they come from, this tells the student that you respect her enough to bother. Kim remembers one time when she had to set the record straight about the diverse South American population at her school. This is what she says. I was listening to the teachers talking about the Mexican kids in our building. And I was like, we don't have any Mexicans. In fact, the kids at her school were from El Salvador and Honduras. So it makes a real difference to just bother to get it right. And it tells that child that you value their history. Once you have that country straight, take things up a notch by learning about students' religious and cultural practices. If the child is a practicing Muslim, he should be told if one of the pizzas you ordered for the class party has sausage on it. If the child comes from a culture where eye contact with adults is viewed as disrespectful, you'll know not to force her to look you in the eye when she's talking. So number 10 sort of works off of number nine. Number nine being learning about the cultural background of your students. Number 10 is, but don't make a child speak for his entire culture. Now, some of this information, by the way, this information from Kim actually comes from podcast episode one of this. She was my very, very first podcast guest, and it's a long one. So if a lot of this stuff is interesting to you, I would strongly recommend you go back and listen to episode one. So in this interview, she shared a story about watching a teacher ask a new Iraqi student how he felt about the war in his country right in the middle of class. She says that's not cultural inclusiveness. I've seen teachers do this and then pat themselves on the back. The student's English is limited, so they can't express themselves very well, and they don't want to represent their country. They just want to be there. So if you anticipate a theme coming up in your class that's going to be relevant to one of your students, have a conversation with them in advance. Or check with your ESL teacher to see if they think it's appropriate for in-class discussion. A lot of these kids are coming from situations that are pretty horrific. So it's important to learn what you can in private and from other adults in the building before you start asking the student a lot of questions in public. So number 11 is show them how to take themselves less seriously. By modeling the risk taking that's required to learn a new language, you help students develop the courage to take their own risks and have a sense of humor about it. This one comes from Mary Yurkowski, my mother, of course. <laughs> She's, this is her story. I tried to say the word paint, pinta, in Portuguese. And this, my mother uh, taught kids from Brazil, and they speak Portuguese in Brazil. So she says, I tried to say the word paint in Portuguese, and instead I said the word for penis, which is pinto. They all roared with laughter while I stood there with a what look on my face. When they explained what I had said, I laughed so hard. I told them that laughing was fine because sometimes mistakes are really funny, but ridicule is never okay. So, you know, when kids are feeling embarrassed and vulnerable, that they're, they're trying to learn a new language and they might sound stupid, showing them how to laugh at themselves without going too far and, you know, ridiculing each other, this will encourage them to take more risks. And risk taking is, is necessary when you're practicing a new language. So along with that one about not taking themselves too seriously, the last recommendation is that you should always take your students seriously. One of Kim's pet peeves about how teachers interact with English language learners is the way they often see students' efforts as cute, missing the whole point of what the student is actually trying to say. She says a student will be desperate to communicate and the teacher will get distracted by the delivery and miss the message. That's painful for me to watch, she says. It bothers her when teachers mistake a lack of language for a lack of intelligence or maturity. When a child can't express themselves as well as they would in their native language, it's far too easy to assume the concepts just aren't in their heads. And Melissa Eddington chimed in on this as well. She says, it breaks my heart when I hear teachers say ELL kids don't know anything. These are brilliant kids and they know a lot. They just can't tell us in English yet. So make a conscious effort to see past the accent and the mispronunciations and treat every interaction, every student, with the respect they deserve. And this is Kim's final quote. 
She says, they're doing twice the job of everybody else in class, even though the result looks like half as much. To download a PDF copy of these 12 strategies and for links to some of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit cultofpedagogy.com, click on podcast, and then go to episode 68. To get weekly updates on all my newest blog posts, podcast episodes, and products, sign up for my mailing list at cultofpedagogy.com slash subscribe. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day. This podcast is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. To learn more, visit edupodcastnetwork.com.